So Professor Soma, again, thank you so much for being here with the team. Uh, you know, I know it's, it's late at night, so we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, we thought we'd take this opportunity just because of what a crazy time it is and now even more intense in the US as we just talked about. Um, so really to hear from you and learn from you about, you know, ways in which to manage stress and anxiety during this time, what you found, what, you know, what you know, or what would be helpful for us to know. So I'll hand it over to you, but, um, but you know, I think if we can open up to questions at some point as well, that'd be great. Um, but over to you if, and, and we'll follow your lead. So thank you again. Okay, you, I think it's a pleasure uh, being with you again. Um, my re only request is that you help me monitor the time. I have lock in front of me on the screen, but uh, as we approach, I mean, this is a very tight schedule today, and uh, I'm asked to um, talk about, cover a lot in a short period of time. So first of all, um, uh, I'm, I was asked to briefly introduce my work. Uh, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist and um, used to be, um, in, in, uh, when I was much younger, a, um, a uh, combat uh, commander. I was a, a tank commander, but later on when I uh, completed my uh, graduate education in psychology, I was moved for, for my reserve duty, as you know, most of the Israeli military is comprised of reservists, not the regular army, is very small. So as a reservist, I was for, for many years a mental health officer, and uh, I was in charge of a um, uh, sort of a MESH unit, MESH mental health unit that deployed uh, just just uh, on the, uh, uh, on, on the, on the hinterland of the, of the, of the, front line so it was i was uh, my my unit was deploying always and redeploying uh based on the advancement of of the combat forces and our task always has been to absorb the uh, psychological casualties of the war and provide them with the uh, uh, first aid um, psychological first aid and ironically um, the uh, good outcome of our work uh, would have been to send the soldiers back to fight. It is ironic because, um, you know, if, you, if we think about the insanity of war, it would be only, only so logical to want to flee the, uh, um, the hell of, uh, of, of, of battle. Um, and uh, people who develop psychological reactions actually try to protect themselves from the overwhelming uh, fear and, and chaos and, uh, and threat of, of, uh, of more of war and, and by, by developing a sort of paralysis and, and psychological conditions which render, render them incapable of fighting. So ironically, our, our role, and it was not, for me, not without conflict, was to fix them so they could go back and maybe get hurt or get killed, you know. Uh, but at any rate, um, um, uh, referring those soldiers back to, to uh, uh, civilian hospitals, we already know, we've developed this knowledge in the uh, Israel Defense Forces, would have resulted in much more severe mental health mental health conditions for them. So those who survive the war uh, and, 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 and benefit from this uh, frontline for psychological first aid are, uh, have much better chances of making it psychologically. At any rate, this was my background to, as a reservist, but as a civilian, um, I uh, continue to, to be interested both clinically and academically in the outcome of stress in general and traumatic stress in particular. And this was the focus of my teaching and my research for, for many, many years. I'm now a professor emeritus, uh, I've, uh, retired last year from teaching, but I have a full scale uh, research program going on and I think it will go on for many years. And I still have a practice. And the practice still focuses on on trauma. Uh, uh, for, for years, I remember at the turn of the millennium, we had a wave of, 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 uh, of terror, a huge terror campaign, the Intifada in Israel, 
So that uh, unfortunately uh, continue to uh, feed our clinics and our uh, research protocols with uh, many more opportunities to study um, the effects of, of stress and trauma. But over the years, I became very interested in the uh, psychological uh, outcome of child abuse and neglect. And uh, that is uh, a much more universal uh, type of, of stressor uh, that uh, also generates much deeper uh, psychological wounds. And I've been doing that for many years. And it was in this context that um, uh, I discovered uh, about uh, 20 years ago um, a disorder that I'm, is currently the main focus of my research, and that is, um, uh, I call it maladaptive daydreaming. This is a form of um, internal absorption that originally I thought uh, survivors of trauma do to uh, escape uh, their bad memories and um, and psychological pain in, uh, in, do, in escaping to fantasy. But later I realized that it's a, uh, this, uh, uh, this condition is based on a trait that some people have, and this trait is innate and uh, not necessarily related to trauma, and people can get, sort of develop a habit, or in other words, get addicted to um, this form of fantasizing even if they were never exposed to trauma. So this is what I, this is in a nutshell what I'm doing. Uh, today, I prepared myself to talk to you a little bit about the uh, stressors of, associated with the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, so, and, and I identified several stressors and I will briefly talk about general principles of coping with that. First of all, what I hear from people is, um, is uh, at least initially, was a source of uh, helplessness, feeling people feeling that um, they are confronted with a uh, threat that they don't can see, that they don't understand very well, and don't know how to protect themselves from. But since then, we've heard so much from uh, the um, uh, health authorities in our respective countries about how to cope with this. Uh, we have had plenty of opportunity to learn how to protect ourselves and others from COVID-19, uh, famous facial masks, the two meter distancing <clears throat> and the hygiene, the strict hygiene with washing of hands are of course the examples that we hear over and over again. And this should reduce a little bit uh, the sense of helpless, helplessness by equipping people with um, uh, 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 relevant um, task oriented coping. Another form of, uh, of uh, stress that I encounter um, in my clinical work uh, with uh, individuals um, during this uh, pandemic period was the stress due to uncertainty. Um, uncertainty has to do uh, with rumors, with conflicting information. You know, for example, of you know how uh, how long does the virus survive on different surfaces? This is just an example. So people are <coughs> naturally uh, looking for information to reduce their sense of anxiety because, uh, um, particularly if you don't trust your leadership, um, and we have had we we are having both in the United States and in Israel different varieties of. Uh, uh, crisis of trust uh, uh, versus our leadership. Uh, so um, when faced with such uh, um, a leadership crisis, people tend to then uh, resort to uh, listening to rumors and the internet, of course, is the major source for that. And uh, of course, my suggestion to people I talk to is to obtain up-to-date scientific information about uh, this illness and how to prevent it. And, and I try to um, you know, encourage people to adhere and, and, and to sources that are credible. In the United States, it will be the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the World Health Organization, or a credible news organization. But otherwise, you know, WhatsApp, for example, can be a source of a lot of fake news. Uh, talking about news, 
another uh, another source of um, of stress for uh, for other people uh, I learned is the um, uh, excessive exposure to news people are becoming overwhelmed by the exposure to news we already know from uh, studies that were published after the um, September 11 attacks on New York that um, that people develop post-traumatic stress disorder in the United States even in the West Coast uh, just by watching the news over and over again um, so uh, if people identify with the victim emotionally because they have relatives there because they you know uh, members of the same uh, of the same country of course we you, you would care a little less i guess if this were a disaster in bangladesh but if it's in your own country of course you care more uh, so the degree of identification with the victims um, increases the potential um, uh, psychological damage by you know exposing yourself uh, too much to uh, to the news so um, I, I i'm generally in favor of, of course uh, that the news media themselves restrain themselves so they don't they don't consult with me about that but sometimes unedited uh, news footage uh, could be quite damaging and I, I would always recommend if I were asked to uh, broadcast things not to direct but with a slight delay so uh, <coughs> so <coughs> the um, television di uh, directors and editors could perhaps um, uh, apply their uh, their uh, judgment as to what to, what to air and what not to air. Um, but people can uh, can protect themselves as well. P people can set limits around news and social media. It's understandable that that uh, one may want to keep informed and and prepared, but at the same time, constant reading, watching, or listening to upsetting media coverage, uh, undoubtedly can intensify worry, can intensify agitation. We know this by, because the evidence, scientific evidence shows, shows it. So exposure does not need to be you being directly exposed to the threat, but also uh, to, uh, to um, images and, uh, and emotions that are broadcasted that are overwhelming. So I would suggest to people generally that when you get the urge to check uh, updates, see if you can pause, notice the urge, delay. I mean, it's it's the the urge not not to miss out, you know. Delay acting on the urge, like uh, any any habit that you want to control, and let it pass without judgment. And you one may want to schedule a specific time to check in with the news instead and not, rather than doing it all the time um, it's also okay i'm telling people to take breaks from conversations with others about uh, the pandemic and uh, to suggest talking about other topics because this really can be too much uh, gen generally speaking so i was alluding here to um, a form of uh, coping that in psychological circles is called uh, mindfulness so be aware of how your mind works be aware of your cognitions, uh, observe them. Um, uh, so the general issue of, um, of um, psychological distress uh, can be coped with through mindfulness, mindfulness meditation. And that is acknowledge your feelings without judgment, whatever you're feeling right now, know that it's okay to feel that way because these are normal times, so feelings cannot be normal. And remember that, that you are not your thoughts and feelings. Your mind is generating all sorts of alarms and false alarms, but uh, this may not necessarily be the reality out there. Uh, so I'm telling people, allow yourself time to notice and express what your mind is producing. And you can also do this through journaling. So you are externalizing this, putting it out there, talking with others or channeling the emotions that you have into something creative. Uh, particularly during lockdown, this could be an opportunity to draw, paint, write poetry, or express feelings through uh, music. So mindfulness meditation exercises are something uh, that is easy to learn. The, the internet is, has a lot of um, 
videos and courses that are free for people to um, learn these uh, these uh, help these skills. They help us stay grounded in the midst of uh, emotional storm, and they're quite simple. Uh, but again, evidence based. I'm now talking as an academic. Is uh, a lot of uh, 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 research um, on the effectiveness of mindfulness um, to um, in in the um, uh, coping and treatment of a variety of, of emotional disorders. So people can learn to witness uh, their thoughts and feelings, and and without getting overwhelmed by them and without merging too much with them. That it's possible to do that. Um, Another source of, um, of, of anxiety uh, or, or stress during these times uh, was a stress due to the uncontrollability of the situation. Um, we, we are not in control over the lockdown conditions and all other regulations and decrees that are imposed on us, certainly not of the virus um, and since there's no uh, cure yet or va vaccination, uh, the whole situation is quite uncontrollable. So uh, my recommendation to people who are worried about the uncontrollability and express that to me is to make a conscious shift to focus on activities that the, you're still able to do or those that uh, you may have more opportunity to do if uh, you were at home more often. So some ideas could be keep, keep learning and maintaining your study, to read a book, to listen to a podcast, to try out a new skill like mindfulness training, uh, learn a new language, gardening. Uh, but very importantly, contribute. Show care towards others. This is very empowering show care towards your family. Again, this gives one a sense of control, but also uh, uh, it ties in with our values. Um, um, help more vulnerable people in the community. Um, it can foster a sense of hope in us and in others, a sense of purpose and meaning. And um, it, uh, it is um, a, a form of coping that uh, can really create what we call post-traumatic growth. Um, another form of stress that people talk to me about is uh, the stress associated with the change that has been imposed on us. And the answer to that, I mean, there are many changes, of course, in the lifestyle, but um, what, uh, even, even when the kind of states and, 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 and cities are opening up, we're talking about the new normal, as it were. Uh, so, the, and, and change and coping with change universally is a stressor. Uh, it, uh, it requires a lot of resources, uh, adjustment resources. And there's a limit to how much change one can sustain uh, without uh, paying a, an emotional cost. So I would say maintain your day-to-day -day activities and routines as much as possible. Um, having a healthy routine can have a, a positive impact on your thoughts and feelings. And um, go back to the basics, eating healthy meals, physical exercise, stretching or walking, uh, even if it's at home, uh, getting enough sleep, um, doing things you enjoy. I mean, th this sounds so banal, so basic, but we're talking about uh, the model I'd like you to think about is one of a battery that we have, a battery of resources. And this pandemic and all the kind of challenges and threats I'm describing, is consuming our resources or our coping resources so it's so like if, if we think about this model of the battery it's important to recharge the battery so i'm talking about charging our batteries so even if we are in self-quarantine or working from home there are many ways to develop new routines healthy routines uh that, that um uh, are an investment in ourselves, not only by creating stability and by creating a sense of control, 
but also doing something fun. Um, two more stressors I would like to talk about and then I'll open it up because <laughs> we are running out of time. So uh, another, of course, uh, form of stress that has been discussed uh, in the media and certainly is being uh, researched by my colleagues is the stress due to isolation. Um, and uh, right now we are um, demonstrating one of the ways to cope with this by staying connected. Even uh, none of you, I guess, uh, is sharing the same room. We are in all different localities and countries. Uh, you are staying connected. I'm connected with you. And receiving support and care from others, um, of course, has a powerful effect uh, on helping people to cope with challenges. Um, so to the extent that we can spend time with supportive family and friends, uh, that can bring a sense of comfort and stability, uh, even if it is online. Talking through our concerns, our thoughts and feelings with others, all of these are helpful ways of um, uh, dealing with this stressful uh, situation. So I will, I'm telling uh, people who, are, who, are, who seek my, my advice to call, text, or video chat with friends and family, uh, share quick and easy recipes, start a virtual book or movie club, schedule a workout together over a video chat, or join an online group or peer forum. I, as I'm saying this, I'm also real, I also realize that this is good for, uh, this advice is good for many people, but not for all people. Of course, um, those who are most vulnerable in these times are so those who have uh, pre-existing uh, psychological issues. So people who are, have been isolated uh, tell me that this situation sort of normalizes their condition, but because everybody is isolated, but others tell me that, and I and we all find it's out in in the in the data that we are collecting that those who are vulnerable, of course, have fewer resources to cope, and feel tend to, would tend to develop uh, um, more serious crises associated with uh, sadness or anxiety, realizing, for example, that uh, they have very few people to reach out to, even online. So that, that, that could be a, um, a, um, a sad realization. Um, and finally, I'd like to talk about uh, the worry about uh, our parents and grandparents. This is, sort of, uh, you know, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be this summer 69 years old and my parents are still alive. There are 92 year old Holocaust survivors and they live in Haifa here. And I worry a lot about them. I mean, they are uh, really my heroes because they are independent. They're not in a retirement home. Um, but uh, they, 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 again, they are worried about death. They're worried about, I'm not, you know, the time will come, not uh, in the too distant future, but uh, they're again threatened and confused because cognitively they're not as sharp as they used to be. They're hard of hearing, they don't see very well, so they can't follow the, all these changes. So older adults, especially in isolation and those with cognitive decline, uh, uh, may become more anxious, more angry, more stressed, more agitated, more withdrawn during this outbreak. Clearly, if in quarantine, they need practical and emotional support through uh, informal networks um, and, and health professionals. We need to reach out to them. They, they don't, many of them don't have the energy or even the ingenuity to reach out for, for help. And uh, in the United States, this is the most uh, worrying situation because in Israel, the families, uh, uh, the extended families tend to stay close to each other in the same cities. In the United States, uh, you spread apart people, you know, you can have your children uh, hundreds or if not thousands of miles away. So I would, I would consider if the second wave of the outbreak comes, if you have good relationship with, uh, with your grandparents, is to consider to invite them to stay with you. 
because uh, we owe it to them. So I gave you a yearly course in 28 minutes or 28 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> that, that was amazing. Yeah, that was quick. That was quick and, and to the point. No, that was amazing and, and your work is really inspiring and I think gives us all some things to think about and understand, you know, the work that you're doing and, and gives us some tips along the way as well.